I think AI in its latest uh, incarnation with the, these kind of text to image uh, uh, generators, let's say, or like even chat GPT, to, like, or large language models and, and, and so on. The digital revolution has taken strong hold. You know. And you call it revolution. Yeah. <laughs> That's great to hear. For, before we collaborated with PUBG, like the only architecture that was there was there to be blown up. <laughs> right? like, and, but when we designed our building, like most of the people uh, playing the shootout games, they weren't actually shooting. They were just like navigating the space. Exploring and, the architecture. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, which resonated a lot with the public, which was the most rewarding thing to see. Um, like just in the first year, there were more than a million visitors. Hi everyone, welcome to PA Talks. In this episode, we're super excited to have Shajai Bhushan, the driving force behind ZHA Code, the computational design hub at Zaha Hadid Architects. Shajai is known for pushing the boundaries of computational design, blending cutting edge technologies like AI, robotics, and 3D printing to redefine what's possible in architecture. We dive deep into the core ideas that shaped ZHA code, exploring some of their breakthrough projects and get Shajai's take on how AI and machine learning are reshaping design processes. Also, we chat about the fascinating overlap between game design and architecture and how new tech is opening up fresh possibilities for complex projects. Whether you're an architect, design enthusiast, or a student, Shajai's insights offer a glimpse into the future of architecture. Tune in for practical advice and a look at how technology is shaping new design horizons. Before moving ahead, let's take a moment and spotlight Pacademy, an online architectural educational platform dedicated to the exploration of parametric design, computational tools, and artificial intelligence in architecture. Pacademy serves as a bridge to advanced design techniques, fostering collaboration with pioneering architects and designers. Through the online courses at the Pacademy, we dive deep into the multifaceted world of computational design, engaging with a wide array of topics that push the boundaries of architecture. You can register and join the live workshops or watch the previous studio workshops recordings. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new uploads. So if you guys are ready, let's get into the podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Shaje, for having us in ZHA. It's good to see you in person. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Welcome to Saudi Architects. Thank you so much. We had an extensive conversation with Patrick. Mm -hmm. uh, very good points, but also I would like to go with some detailed uh, questions with you. How do you operate in the ZH Code team? So tell me what is the core philosophy of building or establishing ZHA code? And what are you guys focus, which operates as the computational brain of Zahid Architects? Yeah, um, Zahid Architects uh, Computation and Design Group, you know, has, was established in 2007, um, kind of co-founded between Patrick, uh, Niels Fisher, and myself. Uh, Niels, you just met outside. Um, and the mandate of the team has kind of evolved uh, as the company has matured and like we now recently built like our 100th uh, project uh, and you know and like also we crossed 500 people um, so so it, like the team has evolved as, as the company chain but the mandate broadly remains similar like to look at the intersection of uh, architectural design and urban design uh, with uh, computational technologies and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and spe specifically to put design at the foreground of um, as a frontier for innovation in computational technologies mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense we have looked at uh, the opportunities associated with these technologies and ask architectural questions of them and and from first principles so it could be technologies of design, um, or it can be technologies of construction, uh, you know, things like robotic fabrication, and on the one hand, and form finding, and uh, you know, reconnecting with the histories of like Frey Otto, and even before that, like the you know, the Renaissance um, Gothic builders, and so on. Like so, 
So that's been the mandate. Uh, it's a bit open-ended, like, um, but uh, it's always been to build up collaborative and cumulative research uh, with industry partners, with startups, um, with universities, um, and uh, and try to make some of them applicable to projects um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in in the company, whether it's products or uh, urban scale or architectural scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you have become one of the greatest leaders in the field of computational design and uh, advanced digital tools. So what kind of breakthrough projects uh, you did with ZHA code since its establishment that was beyond the boundaries and beyond the imaginations? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know whether I'm like uh, leading voice in, in, the, in this field, but like I do feel that uh, I've been fortunate to be um, having ringside view of many things that have happened in the last two decades and London being at the heart of it and Zadid Architects and uh, Architectural Association and then I also you know uh, did my PhD with uh, Philip Block and like ETH Zurich like well, just when the, the uh, ETH was becoming the center of like that revolution as well um, and and so it's been very fortunate like that it's the intersection of like all creative talents uh, um, and and Zadi architects also grew in the, in the same time so I think the breakthrough in that sense uh, in a way has been being in London at the, in the kind of right time um, which still London is still remains like the kind of beating heart of like many creative efforts. Uh, in, in, in the intersection of digital technologies and uh, architecture. Um, and so we started with like very fresh principles, like or fr first principle based approach. Like we did a lot of pavilions uh, uh, projects for the first uh, four or five years since 2007. And then um, which explored like new technologies like uh, applying Maya and uh, form finding techniques um, like that were discovered previously like um, uh, and try to bring a fresh perspective to it um, and just learn these things for from first principle ourselves like try to make things physical um, and so so that was phase one I would say like of like the team uh, and then from 2012 to about 2016, we did more intensive collaborations. We did a lot of competition projects in Zadid Architects, trying to apply some of these tech, tech uh, discoveries that we have made and learned through that, uh, which culminated in like the gallery for mathematics, like uh, which we won as as a I was there two days ago. Yeah. Mind blowing. <laughs> Yeah, and that was uh, also like, you know, very, uh, it alerted us, I mean, it made very personal, like the way Zahadi, the architects generally works, like it's generation of generation after generation of architects that come in, they, they learn this, the required skills and make their network of collaborators um, and, and participate in public discourse around the topics of, that are relevant at that time. And eventually they win some competition and then that gets built. And so, um, um, so that we were also fortunate in that sense, like that, uh, you know, by the end of 2016, we had our first, even though it's a small project, it was like a first physical instantiation of like many of our research ideas from form finding to robotic hot wire cutting for the benches and, and, and also form generation of the streamlines and so on. Uh, which resonated a lot with the public, which was the most rewarding thing to see. Um, like just in the first year, there were more than a million visitors wow. uh, for for a gallery that is like 900 square meters big. And, and as you have been there, you know, it's not that big. And like uh, before we made the renovation, the Gallery for Mathematics had like a dwell time of 30 seconds because people were just passing through. And, and now because of the intervention and, and also the close collaboration with the curator, which was like a fantastic collaboration with um, David Rooney 
um, we were able to tell the story of mathematics in everyday uh, applications. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that part of the gallery was the most time that I spent inside the museum. Yeah, exactly. So uh, going that's, around <laughs> the installation, or oh, what is this angle? Photographing the lights and also checking the some of the <laughs> art pieces there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was very rewarding for us, like as a young team. Uh, you know, um, to to see from competition all the way to completion, and also work with um, uh, work with the experienced people in um, in the company, like Bidisha, she already done. Um, you know, the the Evelyn Grace Academy, the uh, and several other uh, buildings in the UK. So you know, trying to take new ideas uh, and combine it and make it applicable in a kind of commercial setting mm -hmm. uh, was very rewarding. And, so, and then from 2016 to about 2020, we jumped a scale. We participated in all kinds of competitions for you know master plans, towers, and then stadiums and this and that. So finally in 2020, we worked with closely with Nils again and, and Lei um, and Jakub. Uh, we then won um, the Xi'an Stadium, um, I mean, they were like Lei and Jakub won the stadium uh, with their team. And then we joined quickly after, like in the kind of early design phases. Uh, and, and this was when pandemic happened. And, um, you know, we, four years later, the stadium was built. And so recently we went as an entire company, about 400 people to China um, and we saw the stadium for the first time. And so, so that was like amazing to see too, like so 2016 to 2020. And then from 2020 to now, like we really scaled the team as well. We're now about 20, 21 people uh, or 22 or something like that. And, um, and so we can now do a lot of things uh, which we, we have been building up capacity for. Um, we still continue to do interesting pavilion-like or technology demonstrator projects, as we call it. Uh, worked a lot in this p interim period, like for 12 to 13 years with Block Research Group. Uh, I did my PhD with them. Um, and, and so it's been a very cumulative and collaborative effort like to establish um, Zadi's ar architects, um, like the computation and design group uh, mm -hmm. as relevant between research and practice between computation and design and um, to, to really also participate with like a lot of the, the young talent that gone on to make like startups. And, oh, and so, yeah. so it's been, yeah, so far very rewarding. I think that's maybe why I feel like, you know, whenever I talk about it, I feel um, like very energetic about it. Excited, yeah. yeah. Incredible, yeah. incredible. No, congratulations with all these fantastic works you guys have done and also I had a conversation with uh, Philip Block a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, it's not published yet we're gonna publish very soon uh, and their research is highly highly uh, focused on delivering this uh, thin shell uh, uh, system of you know uh, concrete shells uh, and uh, which is quite mind-blowing mm -hmm. and uh, uh, with all your experiences in digital fabrication, new fabrication techniques, actually 3D printing, hot wire cutting, knitting, and uh, any other technology that you can, you can imagine, you had hands-on. So what do you see the future of these fabrication techniques in AC industry? I think the, the entire digital revolution uh, that really picked up pace uh, of course, there have been pre-computer, uh, um, you know, protagonists like Frey Otto and then like also like, you know, uh, Ted Happold and like Chris Williams and like many uh, seminal figures in the UK and like also Foster and Partners like doing the British Museum uh, roof with uh, Chris Williams as an engineer. Like, uh, so there have been early examples of these like and a lot of research has been building up like and then you know, around 2005 onwards, like um, there's been a kind of sustained explosion of new innovation um, uh, uh, with digital design technologies and also digital manufacturing and construction technologies. So the application is like, I think on two fronts. One is um, obviously like on the physical sustainability side, like because 
digital practice is the first step to being sustainable because uh, the, all these technologies deliver high performance shapes, uh, high performance in terms of using less material, um, and, but like delivering longer spans or like higher strength um, and so on. Um, but also like uh, on its own, that wouldn't be enough. Like it also now enables uh, a new generation of architects to, to with a wider repertoire, a wider vocabulary of um, uh, possibilities to, to address the complex needs of 21st century architecture and city making. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, yeah, so these are extremely relevant uh, progressions in the company, uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in the discipline and in the profession uh, uh, to, to kind of uh, over, like follow in the trajectory of modernism, like over a hundred years, like it like had a tremendous impact on everything in the world. Um, so I think this new wave uh, is maturing. Uh, we are seeing like, you know, young practices establish themselves, uh, including I would say like, you know, the teams like ours in many companies are maturing um, to, to deliver a new, new possibilities of our, architecture and urbanism, which is both sustainable from a physical, uh, ecological point of view, but also uh, can address more complex issues and uh, including social issues and, and uh, you know, in, improving um, possibilities of building new cities that the world needs or to meet the rapid urbanization needs um, in, a, in a kind of socially uh, and engage, visually engaging way and in a urban uh, it's not just repeating block after block, like it can be customized. Um, so there are other aspects to architecture that which can now begin to be addressed because like the digital revolution has taken stronghold. You know. And you call it revolution. Yeah. <laughs> That's great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm also a huge advocate of like calling it a revolution and it's like a paradigm shift, sure. of course. What about AI and what kind of uh, advancements do you see in the uh, integration of AI and design workflows and uh, optimization workflows and into softwares? What, what can it change and how it can offer much better, you know, or it, how they can change the way we do architecture? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think AI in its latest uh, incarnation with the, these kind of text to image, uh, uh, generators, let's say, or like even chat GPT, like, or large language models and, and, and so on. Uh, we're, at, it, it's building on a range of like developments, like including in hardware and like, um, and it follows similar trajectory as um, other technologies that come into architecture, which is that like it's developed somewhere else and uh, and then architects experiment with it and give it shape and and, and like then um, you know uh, they bring a lot of enthusiasm and like you know particularly younger people so and this when thing with a black box actually <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and so um, with all of that so it's it's enabling a lot of energy to come into the profession which is which is always great like which is the same with like all the video game technologies just a few years before that and robotic fabrication before that and like digital shape making before that and 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 uh, so where we borrowed heavily from the computer graphics industry or um you know other automobile industry and and so on uh, shipbuilding so uh yeah ai is just like another version of like that uh, where it is beginning to attract a lot of enthusiasm and energy into the profession and of course we need to target that to something meaningful uh, because if it is only about uh, producing image after image, like we quickly lose, you know, it's not satisfying anymore, even for people who are creative with it. Um, so I think asking difficult questions or targeting it to solve um, or apply it to, to, to discover new solutions, like is important. And um, so I think that nobody really knows how it will change, like, but there's so much energy in there, like it is quite, um, uh, it's, it, yeah, that like if it, it, it should be targeted towards like, you know, 
uh, addressing larger problems of like uh, if we can make our buildings more engaging or our buildings and cities more responsible in terms of circularity or um, so I think yeah like it should be targeted at um, at the relevant uh, problems but also it should be paired with like prior expertise which the profession has built up on all you know like you mentioned Willy Block and in all, or like these kind of ge geometric skill set that the the um, the profession has built up like and a lot of these tools now available like we shouldn't forget that um, way in this just because we have this shiny new tool um, because there are many things that you know we can help AI learn uh, certain things and accelerate of progress um, so yeah. Of course, of course, the, the, the image generation is not the whole thing about AI, but also if there was the possibilities that we can use it for optimizations, for creating variations in the structural sense, in the analysis sense, uh, uh, would be much better, of course. We're going to be there, or maybe there are softwares you guys are using or other offices are using, which is internally uh, developed or internally available. But yes, those are the, uh, the future uh, goals with AI, if we can achieve also the uh, chatbots and um, you know, uh, talking to AI agents, we can be embedded to uh, AI software or the 3D modeling <laughs> softwares would be a game changing, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think like, I mean, the few things that we are experimenting with in terms of AI is of course, outside of customizing and fine tuning, you know, text to image generators and using AI rendering where, you know, uh, versus, um, you know, rendering engines like Twin Motion or whatever. Uh, that there is all of those benefits of, you know, just producing images uh, quicker. Uh, but one of the real uses of AI like that is very interesting um, is, is as a co-pilot, right? Like, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and of course, large language models you know, train most of, based on what's available on the internet, like, and then I think, so that's why, like, the more good data we can put out, like, then the chat, chatbots uh, could potentially help um, uh, in being a good co-pilot, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's where, um, like, previous ideas of geometry and, um, or good structurally efficient geometry or so-called tectonism, uh, is really beneficial also because um, before AI, like all of this required a lot of, it took a lot of time to people to become experts at, like, so there's a, it made it uh, expensive in that sense within quotes, like, you know, you needed to spend three to five, seven, 10 years becoming an expert, like, and hopefully with this co-pilot, like we can onboard a lot more people uh, yes. a lot quicker so we can make these idea, these research and development that's uh, been happening in places like um, Zurich and Stuttgart and, uh, and our offices and Fosters and so on like and make it uh, available more broadly and, um, and finally we hope that when it's more broadly available like it will um, it will have the same effect as, as modernism did you know the key to modernism success, one of the keys is like that it was easy for people like everywhere in the world to follow some of the rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and is there yeah. any landscape for making these tools available, like internal tools inside the office available for public? Um, well, I mean, we publish like whatever we do, like, uh, I mean, we're also not like fundamental software developers, right? Like, and so, so we publish the ideas like and we present ideas like in a way we also teach many students um, um, and uh, so and we are building on a lot of uh, openly available knowledge and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we don't have any real proprietary code that we uh, that like I mean yeah we have some automation things and but like a lot of a lot of the information is tacit, right? Like, or it's between our ears. And so yes. we, we now 
hoping that like we can train like um, chat GPT or large language models to learn some of the things that we use like train it on Maya models for example or train it on like Rhino Walt models and like so we know like so the, hopefully the it makes the this knowledge between our years more accessible mm -hmm. like that's um, that's something that's uh, you know, custom chat GPT is like maybe a very, because um, we are experimenting with like NVIDIA, um, you know, chat RTX and like, which is in, in itself based on like open source Llama models. And um, uh, yeah, so whenever we have something interesting, we will do workshops about it. Uh, so we, we, we hardly ever keep anything in house. Like uh, we're one of the cool. most open uh, when it comes to, um, uh, yeah, like uh, the only yeah the only reason we don't publicly announce like mm -hmm. here's a download link is because like we we don't have the expertise to maintain software and maintain. Yes. Um, so this is where like you know efforts like Compass uh, from uh, Block Research Group yes. again, but ETH uh, is very useful because they not only do the research but they also make it available in terms of code. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so incredible, we, yeah. incredible, yeah, great effort. And uh, you've recently grown interest into gaming industry. Like uh, you did also a project with PUBG, mm -hmm. which was incredible. And uh, there's uh, how do you see this intersection of architecture with gaming industry? And a role can be defined for architects in the game industry. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think game gaming technologies like uh, have several applications in in arch or in architecture. Uh, one of which is um, real time rendering, right? Like that. So photorealistic rendering like uh, is very important for wider public understanding of what it is that we do. And um, and previously, you know, you would take a long time for photorealistic renders. And, but now with video games, like particularly Unreal, um, it, you know, it makes things more believable and more understandable uh, earlier on in the project. So because, and, and so participation or civic participation with architecture and civic engagement with architecture and urbanism is, is one of the key benefits or avenues of, um, of using game tech, I, I would say. Um, and the other um, is also, you know, a lot of the gaming technology powers the metaverse um, currently, like, on, you know, and so what the benefit there is that like the metaverse, you can rehearse and test out uh, architectural ideas far quicker. Uh, you can actually have people navigate through your uh, spaces and see where they get lost. So, I mean, it's not 100% accurate simulation of reality. Uh, but it's close enough, right? And 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 so so that's uh, definitely another application. And uh, and and of course, the other application is like gaming in itself. Like you know, when you make something game-like, uh, which is our attempt with PUBG, it, it um, which is helping people understand architecture uh, spaces. Uh, differently because like so far before we collaborated with PUBG like the only architecture that was there was there to be blown up <laughs> right <laughs> like and but when we designed our building like most of the people uh, playing the shootout games they weren't actually shooting they were just like navigating the space and like, the architecture. <laughs> yeah exactly and and so something like that could actually improve um, public understanding of architecture, particularly yes. new unbuilt architecture, right? Yes. Like, which is otherwise, like, you know, people always tend to gra gravitate towards what they know. And, um, and even uh, about the metaverse, I was just enjoying going around those spaces, circulating around and uh, yeah. having the a sense of those uh, curvilinearity. And yeah, <laughs> that's right. And mixed uh, spaces. Just, yes. just uh, it influences a new generation of. Uh, young people to to know yes. a different kind of architecture is possible and and um, and so we are recently collaborating with Fortnite to to create a game um, game demo demo game like uh, which uh, helps people understand the trade-offs in build, building cities right like mm -hmm. you know you cannot 
um, you need urban density, you also need urban activity, and like you cannot just build towers and not build anything else, or you can't also just build little houses and not towers. Like so, so there's all these trade-offs between urban density and and also new new aesthetic of like you know 3D printing or all of these shapes that we've been rehearsing for the last 15 years. Uh, try to make it uh, accessible to to the younger generation, and um, and that's um, you know that's that's been our, our goal with game tech. Like, uh, is it, on the one hand, improve civic participation and engagement with architecture, uh, but also like real um, serious applications on customizing your houses, uh, like our project in uh, Roatan in in Honduras, like which is like. A, uh, which is trying to instantiate an idea that Patrick wrote about like almost 20 years ago. It's called uh, Autopoiesis of Residential Communities. And, and that was based on a DRL project of my um, advisor, uh, Vasilis, uh, and his teammates. And, and one of them is a director in Zadid Architects now, Manuela. And so 20 years later, we used all of the ideas that they suggested in, um, in their thesis uh, is now actually available. You can do digital fabrication to customize the houses um, that are, to physically build them, and you can use game technologies to customize the house, not only interior of the house, but also their 3D location, and, and negotiate with the neighbor. Um, so this project was called Negotiate My Boundary, <laughs> and, and so it's actually... Is there any website for it? NegotiateMyBoundary.com? <laughs> uh, there's a book actually on Amazon called Negotiate My Boundary. Uh, oh, can, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll put the link. Here. Yeah. <laughs> So I think, yeah, so this kind of serious application of like forming communities um, is also something that we are excited by. Like, and if we can, uh, hopefully this project, which is an experimental project actually happens. And if it, if we can form a community of 10 houses, like we can then also maybe scale it up to form a community of a hundred houses. And, and, and we can then form uh, city districts in this kind of so-called co-design way. I mean, everybody talks about co-design, but uh, game tech is maybe one of the ways to make it happen. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Well, incredible. And uh, I, I see that you have huge efforts and a great focus on that area as yeah. well. Uh, congratulations. Uh, what are the softwares that you guys are using in the day-to-day -day life in the office? You know, the, the design workflows and, and especially yourself, what is your day-to-day -day software? Um, I mean, at Zadid Architects, like our main kind of workhorses are Maya, Maya and Rhino. And, and that's mostly because like over time we have realized that like a mesh-based way to design, uh, uh, you know, it's better to borrow from the computer graphics industry and make it applicable to um, architectural design rather than like start with like something like AutoCAD or Revit uh, and try to make it uh, do things that it doesn't want to do. Like, um, so two things that are very important in our choice of software um, is the user experience, end user experience. So Maya and Rhino, like, you know, you can navigate very easily. Uh, so while, while you're designing, you can spin around the model, which is very important as a designer, like, because you're putting yourself in the eye of the end user. Uh, which is very difficult to do in a software like, you know, Revit or like these so-called BIM yeah. platforms. Yeah. Like, you know, they're only concerned about building elements. Like, but we're, what we are concerned is like the, the user experience of the space. And so the end user experience is very important. Um, and the other thing that is very integral to game tech and also Maya and like, is, is like user choice. Like, so, um, so the user is represented, their user experiences represented and also choices represented. So you can easily switch between option A and option B and like these kind of things. Um, and increasingly we found that paradigm uh, resonates so well with like, you know, state of the art research coming out of like block research group, like kind of very compatible with like recent innovations in, in uh, structural form finding or uh, the digital fabrication, rather than like try to get BIM to do all of these things, we take like first principle approach, 
And we found that like software like Maya, the paradigm uh, of so-called edit and observe paradigm that is built into platforms like Maya is very conducive for both design and also like innovations like machine learning and digital fabrication. Like, so it's, it's all coming from that world, right? Like, and it's, uh, so it's more integrated uh, than, than any of the other software that supposedly architects are meant for architects. Like, mm -hmm. so we gravitated to Rhino for similar reasons. Like it was, uh, and uh, you know, it was from the shipbuilding industry and then, and, uh, you know, it's used in product design and like, so, um, so if, yeah, for these two reasons, uh, Maya and Rhino are their workhorses. Uh, but we also uh, have like our own custom um, code base to assimilate like, you know, all the uh, research that we do collaboratively uh, with startups um, or, or universities and so on. Uh, so where we prototype um, many software plugins uh, or design ideas, we prototype in this CAD environment and increasingly all of this ecosystem is highly compatible uh, with the NVIDIA Omniverse, right? Like, and so we recently, for the last year and a half, been collaborating with NVIDIA directly uh, to bring all of this, unify all of it uh, with version control. And, um, and, and again, it's coming from the Pixar world, like the Omniverse, US, uh, universal scene description. Uh, so we took to it like, like an a fish to water. Um, mm -hmm. And so we want to, um, you unify all of the, you know, computer graphics, Maya, Rhino kind of background with like game tech, um, but also a lot of the, the models we now want to reduce the time between design and uh, construction, right? We don't want to re remodel everything. So we... What do you mean uh, uh, reducing the time between uh, because like construction? You mean documentation kind of stuff or the pr facilitating the construction process? Uh, both. Uh, that So we win most most of our work uh, through competitions, right? So our, mo our design models have two uses. One is like it needs to be rendered and so that we can win yes. competitions at the early phase. Um, and so one use and, uh, and the next is like, we need to use that model to be able to build. So we previously, you know, in the early phases, we would win the competition and rebuild everything again. Like, and, and so we want to r reduce this rebuilding. And so increasingly with projects like Striatos with like these experimental pavilions, uh, technology demonstrators we are um, doing, uh, is exactly doing bringing the kind of tectonic aspects right into early design. So we don't have to design in one way and then build in another way. Like it's integrating design, structure, fabrication, and construction, uh, which is what like Striatos like really demonstrated well, right? Like and that's uh, so we want to be able to take that and apply it to like bigger scale buildings like towers and cities and so on yeah. like and, and um, yeah so I think so software wise it's like Maya and Rhino but like ideas wise it's like this kind of integrated design to production uh, paradigm <clears throat> which you know has been maturing under the banner of architectural geometry yes. uh, for, for a long time uh, for the last 20 years so. Incredible and the ways you guys are using uh, Maya and Rhino Grasshopper uh, is incredible and we did a workshop together. I know your skills and the way you express uh, the workflows, the, the works that you do is incredible. Sure. Uh, like learning a software from you would be a <laughs> greatest uh, thing at Zahadid Architects probably. Uh, well, you also teach an uh, AA uh, yeah. in DRL and you work with a uh, block research group as well. With all these uh, experiences, what, what kind of advice would you like to share with younger <laughs> uh, generations and aspiring designers, architects? Yeah, I mean, I, one advice uh, I can probably say is, you know, to, to just really dive into the, the world of opportunity um, that architecture and urbanism uh, currently have like I mean it's like it is one of the frontiers where technology 
uh, can really have an impact. Uh, you know, we, the world needs a lot of cities to be built, like, um, but they need to be built sustainably, like, so that. Um, but there's also, you know, enormous opportunity in applying uh, these uh, technologies that society is invested in mm -hmm. for a long time, and like, you know, uh, make it um, make an impact on on the planet. Like, uh, it, it is a profession that really can influence, you know, millions of people. <laughs> like, and that that I think is is a, is a great carrot um, to 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 dive dive into to a collaborative practice like I mean I always say you know think in decades like and and build build up uh, your experience and expertise in a collaborative way with as many people that challenge you as possible like, yes yeah, yeah. yes well great thank you so much for all these uh, great insights and advices last question uh, what do you think about PA <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, like we've known each other for a while now when yes. PA was maybe not as big as it is now. Yes. And, and uh, <laughs> Very, very first days, I remember. It, yeah, exactly. And so, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, we've always supported your dedication to, to doing things and, uh, um, and, and also, and, you know, providing information to people who might not have had it before. Like, I mean, now maybe with the internet like things are uh, more accessible uh, but like you know 10 12 uh, how many ever years ago when you started it wasn't as easy to find uh, information or easy to find the relevant people so you kind of did a uh, great service to curate uh, people Thank like you. congratulations on your growth so far and hopefully you continue it into the book format that uh, yes <laughs> yes yeah. uh Thank you so much for your time. Very great uh, discussion and sure. conversation. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for coming by, Hamid. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it a lot. Again, I want to spotlight Pacademy, an online architectural educational platform that spreads the idea of using parametric design, computational tools, and artificial intelligence in architecture. You can register and join the live workshops or watch the previous studio workshops recordings. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new uploads. Thank you so much for watching the episode. Hope to see you soon in the future episodes.